be here right now, I, I can't even describe what it feels like because all of us, like the combined number of years in prison that all of us did on stage right here is close to 100 years, all of us. If you combine all of our time together, it's, it's going to be up there. You know, including Jason, he's kind of hiding out in the back of the shows. So I'm actually going to embarrass him, if y'all don't mind. Is that cool? Can I embarrass Jason? Jason actually is going to come up on stage and, uh, and introduce this song, uh, God is a Good God. I heard y'all know about it. Yeah. You know about this song? He's, he's got a mic right there for him on center stage. So he's going he's gonna to jump in on, and he's going to help lead us, lead us with this. Simon, Simon, that's Simon. That's Tracy Simon over there. Roger Hazelton. That's Mark Jackson on the drums. Daniel Fredericks on the bass. They call me Chino. My name is Lorenz. And y'all know that guy right there, Jason Cole. God is good. Amen. He's good. I'm, I'm telling you, man, as we stand today, this, this shouldn't have happened. We're, we're coming all from different parts of Texas. Some of us are still on parole. Yeah. We shouldn't be here. We're going to kick his butt. We're going to kick his butt. I said we're going to kick the devil's butt. Hey, man. 
God is going to be good, keep you in the mud, send you home. That's not how we do church. When we decide we're going to have church, we're going to press in until we can sit at God's feet. This one's real and that one's fake. I'm not saying that. You're messing with some guys that had the privilege of not going to work all day long. Not married. Well, they could have been married, but not going home to the wife, not going home to the kids, not having them over the yard. Did we sit up in jail and do nothing? No, we had jobs and stuff. What I'm telling you, though, is when we went to prison, all of our life's distractions were taken away. Yeah. And then we had all this stuff that none of us in this room have all the time. And in prison, if, if you want to make me mad, come to me and talk to me about jailhouse religion. If you want to take a chance to get this slap across the face, <laughs> come talk to me about jailhouse religion, how everybody's fake. Because what happens is, is we can afford it all this time, and we can do one or two things. We can waste all of our years in prison, or we can take that time that we're not going to have outside of this side of the reservoir and spend it chasing God, reading scripture, and learning. This guy right here, one of my mentors. This guy right here, one of my mentors when I first get saved. This guy right here, one of my mentors when I got saved. These are mentors right here that are behind me. Not just other guys that's my mentor. These are guys when this time I get finally got saved, they scoop me up and then just let me wander around aimlessly. And when they saw some gifts and talents, they started calling it out and encouraged them. Hey, you need to do that. You need to do that. So these guys spent time, spent years learning scripture, learning scripture, learning scripture, perfecting the gifts that was in them, learning to teach, learning to preach, learning to sing. It's an amazing thing. They spent that time wisely. So the jailhouse religion comes when you take that same man and he comes home and he didn't prepare himself for the free world and all the decisions that come with it. And then nobody's out here willing to disciple that man because he's the next offender when he comes home. Oh, you're an ex offender? I've got brothers that were locked up that they went to churches. Man, God forbid, went to churches and they said, We don't take your time here. Somewhere in the Bible says something about when you came to prison and visited me. Somewhere in the Bible says that. Somewhere in the Bible says that, Matthew. When you came to the prison, when did you do these things? When you came to the prison and you visited me. When you saw me naked and you clothed me. When you saw me hungry and you fed me. And then a church is going to tell a guy because he was locked up. You don't take your time here. Well, whose time did you take? That's right. Whose time did you take? Because there's lots of people in this room that could have been in prison. And, I, and this sermon is not going to be all about we were in prison, you weren't. We're not even going there. But it's an honor for us to get to go to prison. Because most of us that are here, if we didn't go, we would not be where we're at with God. That's right. So we all hate what we did. There's not a guy here that's going to tell you that we did. We all hate what happened. We all hate what we did. Let's just get that out of the way. But we thank God it happened. We thank God it happened. So we're going to get this going. I want to ask you permission to have church. I hope you say yes. Because I really don't care. We're going to have it with you or not. So I'm going to invite you guys to have church with you. We're going to go get it. Sit back and watch how church is supposed to go down. You understand what I'm saying? Let's get church. Can I pray for us real quick? Y'all can pray. How many of you are willing, maybe you've never been willing, to just give it your all during the service? You don't have to raise your hand. Oh, you go ahead, raise your hand. It's okay. Get up there and pray, woman. No, just kidding. This is my friend Virginia. We've been before as well. We've got people from all over. Some of these brothers drove from San Antonio. Some of these brothers drove from Dallas. Some of them drove from Temple and Parker Heights. This guy came from Just to come show up and bless you. It's pretty cool, man. But God is good. And we're going to let God do what we're to do. My encouragement to you is, is take advantage. Y'all, do you feel the vibe of church? Do you feel the vibe? God's already here. He ain't got to do nothing. Come on. He's already, he's already here. Amen. So what are we going to do about it? Are we going to join and press in? Or are we going to consciously make a decision? You don't know what I've been through this week. You don't know what I'm going through. 
You don't know the joke that I brought in right now, so I'm just not really going to get involved. Y'all go ahead and sing. Right, all right. I'm not in the sing. I ain't going to sing. I'm just going to mean mug you the whole time you're talking because I really don't want you to think I'm listening. Well, that mean mug don't work on your grandma and it don't work on me. I'm in the prison. I say right. all fake man's there are. So I don't judge a man on a woman by his face because everybody in prison thought they was the toughest dude alive and there was 3,000 of us. So 2,999 of us were alive. Yeah. If everybody was the toughest dude in prison, why? Was that the regime the toughest dude in prison? It's like, this is my evil twin, by the way.
pray if you don't just meditate on it just let God move today and have his way in your heart let's leave here different than when we came in today
They don't give us nice clothes. I thank God for the clothes that I have now. I mean, we wear the same thing year after year. I've been 10 years personally. Year after year, we wear the same thing. And uh, you know what color those clothes were in prison? They were all white. They were all white. And it's funny, you know, I see, I see my brothers, you know, they're all in colors and stuff like that now, but I remember the holes in our shirts, you know, dirty stains, you know, clothes that didn't fit. You're, you're trying to pull your pants up as you're trying to worship because it doesn't, it doesn't fit. They don't, they don't exactly tailor make clothes for you in prison. And yet we were still able, you know, without, without anything, to worship God. And that's why the song, you know, that we just sang, Trust the Lord with all your heart, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, as God was transforming our lives, that second part where it says, Be not wise in your own eyes. You see, we thought we were wise, and that led us into us prison. We thought we, we thought we knew we had it going on, and we thought... We have it all right. And sometimes you can get into that in your own life, where you are at work, where you are with your families. You think like, okay, this is, this is just normal. This is just how life is. But do not be wise in your own eyes. The, the, the picture of family, the picture of life, is what we read in this word. That should be the mirror that teaches us to not be wise in our own eyes. These guys, uh, I've seen them walk it out. I've seen them walk it out. Uh, through hard times, people dying on them in prison. Families that live so far away, they, 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 no one ever gets to see them, you know. When you don't hear from people for a long, long time, you don't know what's going on with your family. You just trust the Lord with all your heart and you're not on your own understanding that God has them in their hands. And I know those same similar situations can be out here right now. You might be estranged from a brother or sister. You might be estranged from your mom or dad, grandparents. You know, maybe your best friend from high school, y'all had a fight, whatever it is. But trust God, he can restore, he can restore amazing things. He can restore amazing things. Trust you, Lord. We put our confidence in you, Lord God. We put our confidence, our full confidence, the weight of our life. We put it upon you, God. You carry all burdens. You're able to lift up. You're able to deliver. You're able to restore, and so we trust you. God, we know there's hope ahead. We know there is hope ahead, there is joy ahead. And so we trust you, God. When times are tough, don't forget me again. He promised us, He'd always be there.
like to repeat that. You know, sometimes when I'm driving in my, my automobile, maybe going to work to the store, usually to work, I have a, a long time to get there, about 30 minutes. And I just get to say, hallelujah. And, you know, say hallelujah enough. It starts to get good to you because, you know, it's the highest praise, right? And so, I just enjoy the time that I can spend with God and just to let him know that he's home.
You know, I was uh, gone for 10 years, and uh, I'm the oldest son of the Asian family, and uh, I have a younger sister. And, uh, you know, my sister, you know, kind of looked up to me, I guess, and I was, and I, really, I didn't even realize it, but, you know, yeah, she, she looked up to me, and when I went to prison, uh, she was ashamed of me. And for 10 years, I, uh, I wrote my sister, you know, I, I got saved you know, right before prison, you know, crying out to God while the judges sentencing me, right? That whole type of thing. And so, uh, the whole time I was down in prison, I was praying for my uh, sister, you know, and she was on like Xanax and smoking weed and partying and stuff like that. And I'm just crying out to God, you know, just uh, help him, Lord. Savior. And for many years, uh, I wrote my sister. And uh, probably in 10 years, I wrote two letters. And my parents would literally have to drag her to visit. Show what's going on in my life. I was learning about God, and uh, he was just kind of looking at me. Finally, one day I was able to call my parents on the phone, and uh, my mom said to me, uh, Don't preach to your sister, she doesn't want to hear it. And um, yeah, that hurt. Here I was experiencing life in prison, like joy in prison. Literally joy in prison. And uh, I couldn't share that. I couldn't, I couldn't make it understood. So I got out. I've only been out three years. And my sister has seen miracles in my life. Within one year of me getting out and her watching my life, she gave her life to the Lord. And now my sister and her husband come to me for counseling. Can you believe that? The same sister who uh, didn't want to hear it turned her head to me whenever I was talking to her across the visitation table. Uh, the same sister who didn't write me for 10 years. The same sister who had to be drugged by my parents to visit me. Now calls me up whenever there's a problem. God heals. Amen. He restores. Um, he builds up. And so I want to say today that if any of you have broken pieces in your life, which I know you do because that's the state of this world, brokenness. Today, God is a healer. You hold my ear. Come, my rage. You are with me through fire. I believe you're my portion. 
something to do that sometimes. He doesn't just give it to you. And so I, I want to lift you up when you go through your problems, you feel like you're down. So remember to hold on that God is holding you. He's not forgotten. He is there. That there is a reason this is happening to your life. And sometimes the rain has to come, whether you like it or not. And let it rain. And let it
Shout today for Jesus. We're shouting for you, Lord. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. We're rising. There's an army. There's an army, there's an army rising up. You're that army. God's called you. There's an army. There's an army rising up. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every. 
every chain, Father God, any bondage, Father God, burdens, Father God, yokes, Father God, possesses of possessions, Father God, anything that's in us, on us, around us, Father God, it's not of you. I take authority today and I cast it out in the holy name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Lord. For your word says, we're bind loose on earth, we bind to heaven, I bind you, say, you have no control of these people, all of them are in their lives. And I loose it from heaven, your angel warfare unto the angel. Listen, heaven, you, God, your Holy Spirit, your grace, your mercy, your love, your shalom, this is our lives, Father God. Father God, and I ask that you to open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to hear you today, to see you, to feel you, Father God, that we would not leave you the way we came in, and we need change. Many women, Father God, many women, Father God, mighty warriors for you, Father God. That we go home, Father God, that people will just feel your presence, Father God. Not because we did anything special, God, but because it's you, Father God, there. Because you showing out, God. Have your way today. So essentially two weeks ago yesterday. And, and the reason I say it was my rebirth is because I was finally off paper. I was able to do this thing that we're talking about now. And bless God. I, I, I appreciate the applause. And, and it's really God-worthy applause. It's not because I did anything. You know, I, I even recently wrote in a post um, that it, it was a 20-year trip. And there were those who were with me and, and those who were with me in spirit. And, and I appreciate those that had been with me throughout the length, the stretch of the ride. And there was a time a, a few weeks back, wasn't it, Simon, about, about a month ago, roughly, right? We went down to uh, see Simon and Nicole. Um, and 
And you know, it, it <laughs> get choked up thinking about it. But I was with another three friends of ours that we sat and saw Blackburn and said, and, and, and we sat there, just the four of us, and, we, and, and, and my wife was there, and, and Nicole was there, and, and, and uh, we were just kind of reminiscing, and we got to talk, and we got to talk, and you know, it was like, we were the same people. I don't want to say it was deja, it was deja vu all over again. We were sitting in the, in the same way. It was a round table and we had uh, oblong tables. It was like octagon tables while we were locked up. But we were getting to sit around the same area. And just what we refer to as talking, we were just chopping it up. Just enjoying each other's conversation, enjoying each other's uh, uh, presence, enjoying the presence of God. Because when we were there, it was more than two or three. But we did, we did, this is the thing, y'all. We weren't talking about going out to the club. We weren't talking about which woman we were going to get with. We weren't talking about anything like that. We were talking about, do you remember when we were in church? Do you remember how we acted? Do you remember the songs we sang? We kind of did a few renditions. I mean, it's, it was just that thing. But it was, I, I, I told them at one point, there was the wall in their house, man. I told them, you got to paint it, man, because it's like pale white. You know, we had white walls. I was like, man, paint the wall. But we sat there and just enjoyed each other's company. And I was just sitting there thinking, as, as, as Cole had just said, you know, we've talked about it often. There was this program that many of us were a part of called the Team Program, and it was Transform, um, Educate, uh, something else. Transformation, something Empowerment, else. and Maturity. Okay, that. And, and <laughs> it, it, was, it was really a good program. Let, don't let my, my memory clouds you <laughs> but it was a program that many of us went through and we developed something we developed a lot because you know I, I don't know how you are but I know oftentimes in my own study I can see something and I'll be wild by that but it does no good for me to be wild by it singularly because when when the gospel went out it went out in droves it went out at first two by two and then and then god sent it out with 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 uh saul of tarsus who became paul later on it went out because of persecution and it didn't just stay at home it went out out and so i sat there and i thought about here we are sitting in san antonio doing this when we were once sitting in hondo doing this and and simon and nicole and some of our, of our other friends that aren't here with us right now have sat with me in my house in harker heights and did this and we've been in dallas and kenton and i was just in new mexico doing this that's the thing the gospel we had a chaplain once there ernest lucio who used to always say it's a worldwide ministry because we're not all from the same place. We had men who were from Guatemala, men who, who were from Honduras, men who were from uh, uh, way across. The, we had uh, Arab men on the unit. And it was just ironic that he would say that. And at first we never got it. We were like, what do you mean? It's a worldwide ministry. We were all right here in Hondo. But it was worldwide because none of us stayed in Hondo. And so it's a pleasure, it's an honor to be here with you all in the presence of God, with you all doing what we said we were going to do. And that's the thing. One of the things about being in prison is you can either let, there was an expression that we used to use, you can do the time or let the time do you. And we spent all of our time doing the time, experiencing each other, learning from each other, being a part of the team program, being a part of the Kairos program where we got to share, where we weren't just reading for ourselves and then sitting down and then doing nothing with it. God has never been that type of God. Even when it was just Adam and Eve, they had to talk to each other. Adam got to name the animals. And I know animals get to communicate with each other. Maybe not like we do, but it's like, man, did you hear that dude call me a shark? You know, in about 2,500 years, they're going to fear me. And the year the shark said to him, but we're going to have a whole week. 
it's an awesome thing to share this. You think about the stories and, and, and the stories and how they would translate. That Man, that's what we got to do and break it down and not just leave it with our own interpretation. And often there were sometimes we had cats who would come through and they would have their own interpretation. And we tighten them up, tighten them up, send them on their way. But that's what the brotherhood does. Now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, which is not exclusive of women, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That's the book of Romans. But I'm just saying that when we do this thing, we get to know each other. We get to know each other, not just from where you've been or what you did to get into that spot, but we get to know each other spiritually. You know, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. That's the countenance of a man. And so I got to see Kobe, uh, 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 a blooming idiot, for a while. Hallelujah. And then I got to see him come. And Jason is no different now before y'all. I, I, I want y'all to understand, he's no different now before y'all than he was back then. He was a fool for the enemy, and now he's a fool for Christ. Right. But when you see the transformation happen, and you have conversations and, 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 and you watch the light go on. And then he comes back the next week or the next time and he's hungry. Well, what about this part? What about that part? It's an awesome thing and that's how we share and that's how we grow. But we don't do it alone. And we don't do it for not. What I'm saying is that we didn't just do it in Hondo so that we could brag about how we did it in Hondo. We did it in Hondo so we could come out here and tell y'all about how we did it in Hondo. <laughs> because it's often that we hear that, that church religion, that, that, that uh, 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 jailhouse. Listen, I'm going to say this and be done. I don't want to take up a lot of your time, but let's just consider that terminology, jailhouse religion. <laughs> Joseph who we will we will ad, 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 we will exalt for being second in command behind Pharaoh but Joseph huh, started off the only reason he ever got to Pharaoh was because he was in prison when you talk about Peter you know, uh, and I know some, sometimes this blows our mind, but we talk about Peter. Andrew, who, who you have the X cross, right? Because he did not feel like he was able to be crucified as Christ. You have the X, but guess where he was? Prison. You talk about Peter and how Peter was a great man in that upside down cross that the, that the Satanists think that they got because of they're so smart. Well, that's what Peter did because he felt like he could not be crucified as Christ but you know how he got to that upside down cross he was in prison Paul who was who was traditionally known to have been beheaded it wasn't he wasn't beheaded walking around the streets of Rome it's because he was in prison and my last example but it's our greatest example He died, shed his blood. He gave his all on the cross for us. He was bruised for our iniquities. And it didn't happen just sitting in a room or an upper room in Jerusalem. It happened in prison. No judgment, well, only judgment, but no trial. So when I hear the term jailhouse religion, I'm offended because 
most people don't understand the concept and they think that it's just, if they think it's a slight. But baby, if you crack the book, there'd be a whole lot that you see came out of prison. God bless you. My name is Roger. Uh, I did 10 years with these guys. And uh, this is it's like a dream come true. You know, we go to churches, we, we minister, we just share our lives with people that God has done with us. I've always considered myself the least of the least, you know, the worst of the worst. How could God love me? And to be here today, fully here, where we can all travel and go places is awesome. And I thank God. It's, it's, it's a blessing. I used to pray in prison. Uh, <laughs> I was real selfish. I always had people pray for me. I wanted, I wanted things from God. I wanted to dream Yes, like a genie. I remember that. <laughs> and uh, I had to learn that God's not a genie. But the crazy thing is in prison, I used to pray for a wife. I wanted a family, a wife, kids, uh, the house, the truck, you know, all the good stuff that the American dream. And God blessed me with every single thing I prayed for. I, I got the American dream and I, and I got there and I was like, and what now? That dream was great. I mean, I love my wife and my kids and remember, I love you, babe. But when I got there, and God gave me everything I desired and wanted in life. I was left asking, what now? I've got the toys, the, the guitars, the... I was like, what now, God? And I feel like God was just speaking to me and saying, me. Are you ready for me now? Mm. And so I ask you guys today, are you ready for God? It's easy to go through our lives. We have family problems. We have issues. You know, you're working. you got things that come up, and it's easy to forget who we really serve. It's easy to come on a Sunday and, hey, brother, sister, how you doing? Hey, man, I'm good. I'm good. But you're really dying inside. Monday through Saturday, you're dying. It comes Sunday, I'm good. Hmm. In prison, we call it a, a facade, a, fa a mask. We all wear a mask. And in prison, uh, it's hard to do that because you live with the guy. If me and you were sellies and we're in church, oh, everything's good. I know it's not good because I live with you daily. I know how you cuss like a sailor. I know how you drink the hooch. I know how you smoke. So it's hard to do that in an environment like that. So in the free world, what we call a free world, it's easier to get away with that stuff because we don't see what's called your private life or the Bible calls closet life, your one-on-one -on -one time. And I'm not here to point fingers at you because I was that person. There's still times I don't feel worthy of what God has done in my life, what God is still doing. I, I question him all the time. And he tells me, just shut up, stupid, and go. <laughs> and I've been blessed with two kids. I have a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and I have a beautiful wife. I'm 34. She's 27, so I married younger. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then these are my brothers, man. I mean, I call them when I'm, when I'm struggling. Gino gives it to me. He comes over, and I really don't want to hear it, but he gives it to me. Nate, it's good to see you again, bud. <laughs> One thing I would encourage you guys with that when things seem like it's just you want to give up, keep going forward, push. There's this thing I read that says push, pray until something happens. And a lot of times prayers are our last thing. You know, we, we have financial issues. We want to go take loans out. What can I sell? What can I pawn? What can I do to fill this money void? When God's just standing there, you know, I have the land and the cattle. I built all this. Prayer is usually our last. So what I want to leave with you is pray first. I promise you, God, move mountains. You might not always like the valleys. I hate the valleys. They suck. But I've learned to let it rain, God, and there's nothing I can do. Let it rain. I want to leave you guys with that. Hallelujah. And I'm not the evil twin. Uh, almost didn't make it, you know. Uh, the Word of God declares that uh, you're blessed. He who finds a wife finds a good thing, and obtains favor from the Lord. You know, so my wife, she had to had to bow me a little bit to get me to uh, get down here, you know, because I'm always, you know, we say trust God, but I don't always do that, you know, because I'm like, 
I mean, we got bills to pay. You know, we Dallas, if we go down there, we going to, I mean, can we going to spend, you know? And so, you know, uh, it was, it was kind of hard, but I, I am very blessed to be here. I'm glad I got here. Uh, the songs that we sang, you know, uh, the majority of them were, were written by, by these guys, you know, and by myself. Uh, but when I came in, I saw this. Fred had asked me, uh, was there anything that I wanted to sing? And I was like, remember you are love. Because one thing you cannot get away from, I, I don't care. See, love is not love is not love just when everything is going good. All right. That's not love. Oh, I love you because oh, it's good right now. But when, when, when a brother or sister falls and they're not doing the right thing, how much do we love them then? Do we love them then? Or do we be like, oh, you know, oh, that, that, that brother there, that sister up. We turn our back on them. That's not love at all. Not according to the word. Not according to the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. It says I can speak about it. I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels. But if I have not love, I'm just talking loud and I ain't saying nothing. Paraphrase. I'm talking I'm not saying anything. But when a, when a brother or sister falls and they're down in there and you're like, man, let's get it. I mean, I don't care how many times it happens. The Lord said a righteous man falls seven times. But he gets back up. Are we there to help that individual get back up? Or do we talk about them? Do we stomp them when they're, when they're down? The song says, when it seems like a flood of troubles come your way, and when it feels like you have no power when you pray, when it feels like the devil's got the best of you, stand on the promise that God will see you through. And remember your love, no matter who you are. Remember your love by the greatest love of all. See, a lot of times we have to put our fo focus on that love because we know how men and women can be. They can be cruel. Huh? Every time I try to speak about anything else, the Lord always tells, takes me back to love. I used to sing a song with it because that's what I do. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to sing a song because it's, it's, it's faster. Uh, it's, what kind of love is this? You might not remember where, where it is, but you can find it. This song is, is talking about our Lord and how he paid the ultimate price for us. You know, he loved us even when we were in sin. The word of God declares that he died for us. In Romans. I am. Oh, yeah, you, you did start this, didn't you? Yeah, go ahead. You remember? All right. No. Everything he suffered. Well, I spent, I, spent, I spent 14 of my 20 years with this guy. He taught me everything I know about music. And I was afraid to get up under the piano because you, know, he, he, you see him now, but uh, we had a nickname for him. And it was the Mad Conductor. And a lot of guys didn't get to see that part of, part of him. We got in the choir in 99. And uh, 2013, that was January of 99. 2013 was when I left the unit. I think you left 2012. Yeah, right at 14 years. And so uh, I got to experience the Mac conductor. You couldn't hear the note. You couldn't even whisper. He hears everything. Everything he suffered, all the pain and scorn, mockery by those he came. To rescue from the arms of death, the breath we gave us you. To curse his holy name, despised by those he gave his life for, spent on by the same, no less. What kind of love? They 
happy as the day knew not. Still we take for granted what blessed immunity we have from sin, death, and the grave. What opportunity we got. What kind of love is this that through all who insist on giving all for those that wish to have him die? What kind of love does not care if you love or not, but still love you enough to lie down and be crucified. He gave his life when we deserve to die. He gave his life and never once asked why he had to be the one to bear. All of the problems of a world that did not care. What kind of love is this that through all would insist on giving all for those that wish to have them die? What kind of love does not care if you love or not? but still love you enough to light up and be crucified. Hallelujah. Now that's love. That's love. He said he loved us enough that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Even when we were sinners, I like to grab hold of that because uh, even when we were not lovable, he loved us anyway. And he paid the ultimate price in our place. Now that's love. How many of us would do that? How many of us would do that? Do that for a brother that's in need, a sister that's in need. Because we were all in need. We were all in desperate need. For had he not paid the price, we would all be burning in hell. Hallelujah. That's love. That's real love. Hallelujah. Remember your love. Amen. First, let me give honor to God who is head of my life. And let me thank you for allowing us to be here today. Uh, my name is Mark Jackson. I was on this unit with these guys for I don't know, 15, 20 years. I, could, I can't remember. Um, I don't call them friends. Y'all see me. These are my brothers. So we're not, we're not friends. You know, you have your family, your blood, but this is my family. This is who I go to, talk to, when I have problems. Um, it's been a blessing just keeping in touch with all these guys. And we do birthday parties, like going to Fred and, and just sitting around eating. Like he said, just conversation. Messing with Simon and when he mess up, calling Smokey Smoke when he can't sing the song right. But we all smoke, so. But it's always been a blessing um, to just be with these guys. And, you know, we all go through everything. We go through a lot. And I'm not just talking about us. Also you. Y'all all go through something. And this has been a blessing for me because I want to just, I don't, I don't want to get off anything like he say love and everything. You know, and I had to explain that to my family my blood family last week let me just give you a little story I just came back from Arkansas like a week ago 
where I had to do two funerals. One was my cousin who passed away with cancer. And the other one was my aunt. Well, when I was at work, you know, I knew my cousin had cancer real bad, and, you know, and she kept saying, hey, Mark, I want you to come home and see me before I die. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to make it. Well, she passed away before I can get there. I was strong, you know, because I knew God had me. He always had me. No matter what, he always had me. But when I was at work, my phone rang, and my, my coworker said, hey, man, you need to answer this phone. I'm like, no, nah, we got to finish. He said, no, you need to answer this phone. When I answered the phone, my sister stated, hey, I have to let you know something. She said, my aunt was killed. She was murdered by two guys that robbed the house. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I just said, okay. And yes, I'm not going to lie. Call me a big softie, whatever. Yeah, I cry at anything. Cold. These guys, they, they know. Um, I went off and I shared a tear and I said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know what, what, what's going to take place. Well, as the day went by, I realized there's nothing we could do or say. But God put it up on my heart to not hate the guys that killed my aunt. It was two 18-year-olds that went in the house to rob her, and they killed her over nothing. Now, do I hate them? No. I love them. I have to love them. That's our way. No matter what we go through, whatever we see out here in this road, or whatever, or somebody say something bad to you or take a parking spot, we still have to love that person. You know, it's sad we can't even park and people get mad and shoot a person over a parking spot. You know, they talk about us in prison, but I learned a lot. Because I, when I gave my life to Christ in prison, he'd done something to my heart. It was, my heart used to be hardness, I don't know, a brick wall. Now, it's not. Every little thing I can, I try, I try, I try my best, because I'm not perfect. I try my best to do the right thing towards people no matter what color, what creed, whatever it is. And the thing that I didn't saw in this journey, because it was a journey, is you have to not just love that person that does something to you, but you forgot to forgive, and you got to be able to talk to them and let them know, hey, it's okay, it's okay. And I'm trying to, I'm in the process right now, uh, trying to get back to Arkansas and talk to the two guys and talk to them and let them know, hey, God loves you no matter what you've done. First, you got to forgive yourself. Once you forgive yourself, then God forgive you too. Now, it was kind of hard for me to try to explain it to my family because they see they was very angry. Let me just put it that way. They was very angry because here they are, they're like, hey, they kill our aunt and blah, blah, blah. And, hey, you have to love them. You have to show God's love towards this person, especially if we want to make it to heaven. And if we don't make it do what God asked us to do, guess what? We're not going to heaven. And it's, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, it hurts. But when you have God in your life, he does a lot for you. He know how to hear you. And you know, we, we are men. I had a boss to tell me, he said, you're a man. I said, yeah. He said, men don't cry. I said, what? <laughs> I said, what did you say? 
He said, men don't cry. And it hurt me so bad, I went to the back and I started crying. And I, they were like, man, what's wrong? I said, this man told me men's not supposed to cry. I mean, I don't understand that. Because my concept of a man crying is letting something out that God put inside him to try to strengthen him. And when I have problems, my baby brother right here, I can call him any day. He was there for me when my dad got killed. All these guys was. Simon, they was there for me. They was a shoulder that I could lean on and cry on when I needed someone. Let me let you know something. Ain't no man in this world as tough as God. Okay? I don't care how big he is. He can be six foot five, 375 pounds. If God want to break, break that chain, he can. Yeah, I'm, I'm about 260. Yeah. Well, I ain't big as my brother back here, but I'm, I'm about 260. He broke my chain. He really did. He broke that chain. And you know what? I'm not mad. I'm not upset. I'm not none of that. I'm, I'm happy he did because he gave me a clean heart. And that's, that's the main thing for me because uh, I can love anybody that comes my way, no matter who they are. And if I can help you, please feel free to call me. And if I can't, I'll let you know. Hey, I, I, I can't do it right now, but hey, one day I can. Because God give us the ability and means. God make us leaders. We're the leader of the household. And that's where we have to be. Don't be afraid to cry. Don't be afraid to tell people how you feel. Because you do, that means your heart is hardened and God needs to do some work on it. I just want to say thank you for allowing us to be here. This truly is a blessing to be here with you guys. Um, I was kind of the first one because I didn't want to do 50 push-ups and before I, because they told me if you don't show up on time, you're going to do 50 push ups. Well, right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just, I. But it was a blessing. This truly has been a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to come and worship with you. A blessing to come and spend time with our, my brother over here, which he don't never stay at home. Um, and just, you know, just to be able to fellowship with new brothers and sisters. Because I'm going to let you know right now, when we walk out this door, we're not just friends. We're a family. Okay? All as a family. I wish we could all get up here on the stage and take a picture so I can sit at home and show my family, hey, I got a new family. <laughs> uh, you think we can get everybody up here? It's a lot of it's a lot of a lot of family here, man. Uh, right now, okay. I, hey, and if y'all willing to do it, I'm willing to do it too. Cause I would love to have pictures of my new family. I just want to say thank you once again, and I just want to wish nothing but blessings on each and every one of you. Thank you. I'm gonna ask my brother Kalen to come up and say a few words, and then I'll close this out. We're keeping y'all after on purpose because we don't want there to be a line at the restaurant whenever we let you loose. We know you want to go eat, but I don't want there to be a line. Kalen? I just going to say, you put me on so they can miss their IHOP? Come on, man. You're killing me. You don't have IHOP in Canton? What do you got, Denny's? You guys got... Can you tell my Yankee? Anybody? Yeah? So Jason told me to come up and, uh, and tell you guys my story. Um, and... I'll be honest, that's a little scary because I have really never shared my story with a group of any more than two, and that would be my lawyer and my mom. So, <laughs> so my story, my story uh, is long, but I know you guys got to get to Denny, so I'm not going to make it very long. So my story starts in 2007. I was convicted. Um, for those of us who know what this means, I am a registered offender 
which means that like some of these folks and some of these great men that are up here, um, I am not an ex-offender. I have to live with this the rest of my life. So when I prayed to, uh, when I prayed to God about what to, what to talk to you guys about, he, he gave me a uh, kind of a, an idea, and that was the idea of talking to you guys about labels. Now, labels go two ways, right? So when you guys hear that somebody is a registered offender and they have to carry that with them the rest of their life, you think, oh, man. I don't want to let this guy near my kids. I don't want to let this guy near my family. I don't want to let this guy near my work. Now, what I can tell you is in my time, I've done much less time than these gentlemen. I have done a year and a half, uh, once for the crime itself, and then once uh, for having a MySpace page. My, my girlfriend at the time made me a MySpace page, and they violated my parole. Uh, they put me back in. I was extradited, handcuffed, and chained um, to, a, to a van, and then extradited for a three-day trip from Phoenix to Texas, and anybody who's ever taken that trip knows it doesn't take three days, and that you should really have some AC, which they did not. So this is in the middle of the summer for anybody. Yeah, yesterday, mm, that's not fun in a van, guys, let me tell you. Um, so, so anyway, that all happens, and uh, I go back, and I come out, and I'm like, all right, man, I, and I found God in prison, amen? Because God is not a God of shackles. He is not a God of chains. He is a breaker of chains, as the song says, right? He's a God of second chances. And the fun thing is, he's not just a God of second chances. He is a God of third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth, twentieth, and fiftieth chances. Because when I got out, I did not walk the walk. When I got out, I found drugs. Because those were fun, right? I was labeled. It took my power away. I had no power left. I lost my job, I lost my wife, I lost my daughter, I lost everything. And I said, okay, God, well, I mean, I, th th this is the life I'm going to live. So the devil said, oh, let's try drugs. And that worked for about three years. Then he said, oh, let me take everything else from you. Let me take your money, let me take your job, let me take everything. And in Kansas in 2013, I was homeless. And... What I can tell you about that time is that it's not so much that you don't believe in God, it's that you truly don't seek God. And what I can tell you, church, is this today. As you look around this room, somebody needs a hug. And it's funny that the power that a hug has to break things like labels because labels will not only take your power, they will empower you to do the wrong thing. They will empower you to do evil, to believe whatever lie the devil is telling you, to believe that fear that you should not go out and talk to people. Because I promise you, when I was an 18-year-old man and I was convicted, it would have been beautiful to have somebody from the church come up and say, you know what? You are not that person. You are not that way. You are not bound by that. You are better than that. God has power for you. He has life for you. He has everything that you have ever wanted. And I didn't have that. And church, I'm going to tell you why. Because somebody, like the people in this room today, didn't believe the Great Commission. Right? They didn't think that God was like, oh, you should go out and talk to people. Now, I will tell you today, I am a salesman by nature. I have several successful businesses. God has blessed my life more than I could have possibly imagined. Possibly imagined. And the funny thing was, I had money, I had notoriety, I had everything that I thought. I wanted, and like Roger, I believe, I got the American dream. And then I got there, and I said, oh, well, this isn't really all that fun. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, it wasn't fulfilling at all. I had everything I ever wanted, or I thought I wanted, and it wasn't that fun. I was about lukewarm for God at that point. And then, and then, I go to this little place called Captiva Island, Florida. And I go there trying to be an author because I've always wanted to write a book, which I've done now. And I stand up and I kind of tell a little bit of my story because, like I said, I don't tell my story to people. And funny thing is the, the teacher of the class comes over and she says, man, you got to meet this guy, Jason. He is somebody. <laughs> Whoever laughed, you know. So <laughs> you got to meet this guy, right? So I say, okay, as so many of us offenders have said before, oh, I can relate to your story. We talked about this the other day. I've done 30 days in county jail. I can relate to your story. Yeah. Okay. I did a drug once. I'm just like you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So 
I go and I meet Jason, and I'm going to tell you, this is the most blessed friendship I've ever had in my entire life. I've known this man now, what, eight days we've actually spent together over the last eight months. And I've been blessed to be with his family, his wife Cassidy, and his two amazing, amazing daughters. And let me tell you something, guys. Love is real. Love breaks chains. All right? Love does not leave you where you are. It does not leave you rich but powerless. It does not leave you worldly and godless. It does not leave you with nothing, even though you have everything that you thought you wanted. Because that's what labels do. Now, let me tell you, this goes two ways. Because from people like me, we have labels for you. You are the church. You are church people. Okay? You are church people people, which means we do not want to be around you. We can get over on you. Those of us who have hustlership in our past, which is what I call it, right? That inner hustler. We can get over on church people. Now, let me tell you something, church. I am a salesman by nature, so I'm going to tell you something today. You need to learn how to sell Jesus Christ. You need to learn how to sell him. Pitch him to everybody. That is the Great Commission. Commission in my world means that's how we get ahead. That's how we make money, right? Because we're a commission-only salespeople. If God called it the Great Commission, he called it that for a reason because you will reap more with the Great Commission than you ever will in the world today, I promise you. You will have a line of people waiting for you at the pearly gates that say, oh, no, no, God, this one gets in. This one gets in because I've learned this. If I've learned anything, that no matter how much money or how many houses or how many cars or how many things that I have, souls are what are ours to reap. Okay? You have to get out there. You have to break the labels of people, and you have to sell it because I promise you it will not be easy. It's not made to be easy. You think the devil's going to make it easy for you when you get out there and you're like, man, God is great. Jesus is awesome. You need to believe. And they're just like, yeah, okay. All right, Jesus is going to break me from where I'm at. I'm a wife whose husband just cheated. I'm a husband whose wife just cheated. I'm a man who just lost my job. I'm a mom with a kid about to go into the army and go fight for his country as an airborne ranger. This is my wife, by the way. My son enlists tomorrow. You know, I... uh I'm broke and I don't have a job. I have nowhere to go. I'm living on the street. Guys, these are my people. These are people that if you think that you have problems I don't have, I promise you, you don't. You think you've done anything that's unforgivable? I promise you, coming from my point of view, I have tried everything to not listen to God, and you don't. He forgives everything, everything in the world, and he wants you, which is what's more. If Jason has taught me anything and his family has taught me anything as I walk up to the house when we pull up, his daughters run outside and they say, Daddy, Kalen. Now, they've never met me before, but I'm wanted. There's a difference, guys. There's a difference when you go out and talk to people and you don't tell them that it's just a church hype. You tell them that God actually wants them because that's what makes the difference. We think that everything we've done is too much and God is too little and it is your job to tell us that we're wrong because had that not happened I don't know where my life would be I'd probably still be homeless hooked on drugs or I'd be rich and hate my wife and kids and then they would lose it is your job church to go out into the world that is lost and broken and sad even though they put on that face that these guys talked about. And to change that. And if I leave you with one thing today, it is that you need to really take that seriously. That is the best possible thing that you can do to change the world. And you have that power. You have that strength. And that's all you'll ever need to do. Because you'll have the army behind you saying, nah, man, this guy... This guy needs to get in. It doesn't matter what he did. Christ saved all that. He needs to get in. And guys, I thank you. As much as this is a realization of their dream of 10 years, I got kicked out of ministry even though I took a semester because of my background. They told me they would never ordain me and I would never speak in front of a church. Not today, Satan.
<laughs> Thank you guys very much. It's been a pleasure. If I can't move my hands, I can't talk. Good luck. <laughs> oh, wow. How's everybody? Is that good? Is that good stuff? Somebody clapped their hand and just said, yeah, we're just ready to go. Well, huh? Y'all got a little bit left in you? Just a little bit? Oh, see the, see the Methodist and Baptist left already. We got a couple of seats left. No, nah, just kidding. I know they didn't leave because my brother is a Baptist. Hey, Dan, can I, would you stand up and let me honor you real quick? This is uh, Brother Dan Tarno. He was my pastor whenever I was a youth. And that's his lovely wife and his daughter there. Brother Dan, I love you, man. Thanks for being here. What's up? You finna take over? What you, which microphone do you want? You rush the stage. I ain't gonna tell you no. This one work. Hello? Virginia. Go ahead, go ahead. Probably for what? Four days. Eight months, but eight days, really. Yeah, four yeah. days. But what I have to say is you guys on stage. Today, you have brought me so much joy. My husband did 17 years. He was out for six years, and God called him home. I feel such a bond with you guys. I used to tell him all the time, joy is for you. Joy is just not for what we call, and I, I hear these terms, as you guys said, the, the free people. Joy is for all of us. You guys have done amazing things, but it's not even close to what you're going to do. Amen. I thank you guys so much. You have actually brought my husband back to me for, it's just for a little while. Mm. Because I knew he was going to do amazing things. And, you know, I often thought it was so unfair that it was like I did 10 of his 17 years with him, and then I only got six. How unfair was that? But I know it was his time. I knew he had did what he was meant to do. I knew he was saved, so I was okay with that. So I just want to thank you, thanks for getting me here. I'm actually from Uber's over by the DFW airport. And when I saw it, I said, Jason said, you're coming? I'm like, I'm coming. <laughs> I, I'm coming. This has been so amazing for me. And I thank you so much. Right. Thanks. There you go. Ready to go. Well, crap. <laughs> Man. Almost made it the whole time. What is that, Kleenex? No, those are fake tears. I'm good. Uh, man, God is good. God is good. I don't even know what we're going to talk about. Everything I thought I was going to say, the guys already said. But I guess the one thing that, uh, there's so many blessings here. My, one of my pastors is here. My boss is here. I guess I got to act good for him because I got to go to work tomorrow. Uh, Friends here, families here, guys I did time with are here. The church I go to now is here. The church I used to go to, there's people. Just a really awesome, awesome day. Then to get to be around my guys again, let them share some of their heart. Uh, Virginia, I, I appreciate you coming. I'm glad you're here. Uh, when I, I met Virginia, we've, again, we've known each other eight months, but really about four days is all we met. But whenever we met, you were still real broken. Still real broken. It was all fresh, losing your husband, waiting on him all that time. Then he came home and passed away, you were still broken back in January. And just to see how far God's brought you in that little bit of time is pretty stinking cool, really amazing. Uh, but anyway, I just want to jump in. But I guess the overwhelming feel, I want to end up, fear is what's in my heart. Like I'm not standing up here afraid. But like listening to everybody's stories, it shot me back to doing time with these guys and even though we had the vision of coming to a church and blessing a church, there was still the fear of whenever I come home, who's going to accept me? And then we had homeboys that got out before us and they said, we don't take your kind here. Just like Kalen said, you'll never speak in front of a church, not with the charge that you had. Then here he is standing today getting to speak to a church. 
Not today, Satan, right? And I wonder how much time did I, did I waste out of my 11 years, how much time did I waste thinking what church is ever going to accept me into the congregation? What church is ever going to let me preach? What church is going to want me to be around their kids after I did 11 years with this murder case, right? In their right mind, what family is ever going to want an ex-offender to be around them or in their church? You just go through all this worry, all this fear, and you see how it paralyzes you in Virginia, how it paralyzes you, you know, to move forward and seeing you today is awesome. But I wanted to say this, because my ultimate goal to leave today is not just to sit here and be blessed this whole time, but my, my goal is to bring some encouragement to you guys too, through my brothers and I, what God did with us. But I'm sitting here thinking, and I've said this once before, but like, if you're, if you're an Israelite, if you're a Jewish person growing up, you look forward to two things. Getting married and being underneath the most prominent rabbi that there was, a teacher. That was your two life goals right off the bat. As you're born, as a male especially, that's what you wanted. To get married and be underneath the most prominent rabbi that there was. So the bigger the name that you were underneath, the more clout that you had. Right? Makes sense? So I want to be underneath Billy Graham, or I want to be underneath John Maxwell, or I want to be underneath... Same thing back then. You wanted to be underneath the biggest name that was a teacher. So as a child, by the time you're five, six, seven years old, you've already memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. What they call the Torah. Seven or eight years old. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible. Got it memorized. How many of y'all got that memorized yet? How old are you? You don't have it memorized? Is anybody past seven or eight years old? Do you have that memorized? Eight years old, got the first five books of the Bible memorized. By the time you're a young teenager, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then all the minor prophets memorized. By the time you're 14 and 15 years old, what we know as the entire Old Testament memorized. Yeah, you're like, uh. The entire Old Testament memorized. And so when you get about the age of 14 or 15 years old, you start seeking out a rabbi to interview. So if you're the rabbi, hey, I want to follow you. Listen to this because there's a huge difference coming up. I want to follow you. And so the rabbi would start asking questions out of this book. The scripture says this. What does it mean? And he had to explain that. He'd ask him to recite some things. Basically, he had to pass this test, had to pass the interview. And at the end of it, the rabbi would either say, ah, you just didn't make the cut. Go back to your family business. And a family business would be fishing or carpentry or something like that. You just didn't make the cut. You don't have what it takes. You can't be underneath me and my name. Go on back to what you know. Or he would say, follow me. Now let's paint a picture. Now that we gave you a little history, let's paint a picture of what you do know about the Bible and we'll plug them together. When you get to Matthew, you see Jesus is walking along and he comes up on Peter, James, John. He, he comes up on these guys that are fishing. Grown men that are fishing. Grown men that are fishing. Now after the historical backdrop I just gave you, what does it tell us about Peter, James, and John? They didn't make the cut. To the world, they didn't make the cut. They didn't have what it took. You're not smart enough, you're not sharp enough, you can't be underneath me. At some point, they came to some rabbi and they said, I'm sorry, fellas, you don't have what it takes. Go back to your family business. So they're out there fishing. The reason why I had to stop and study this one day is because it drove me nuts how I could be a grown man fishing. I love to fish. Like, That's my thing. And some dude comes up and says, follow me. And they drop their fishing gear to follow him. Fool, you better get a pole and join in. You better start fishing too. I ain't leaving the fishing pole. Are you crazy? But this guy named Jesus shows up and says, follow me. And they literally drop their nets, drop their fishing gear, and follow this man. And the Bible never stops and goes into why. Why does Jesus show up and says, follow me? And these grown men drop everything. Because these grown men wanted so badly to be up underneath the rabbi, they went to one. And that rabbi said, y'all don't have what it takes. The best y'all are ever going to be is fishermen. Go back and do that. Jesus, the rabbi of all rabbis, the teacher of all teachers shows up and sees the same men that the world says you don't have what it takes and you're never going to have what it takes and we can't do nothing with you. And Jesus says, you're perfect. I can work with that. 
I can take that imperfection and turn it into something for my glory. Follow me. I can work with that. And they dropped everything. Are you kidding me right now? We, we went to the rabbi and they said, you're not good enough. What is this rabbi doing seeking me? Can you imagine that? God is seeking them. Let's turn it around one time. People in this audience, God is seeking you. If you're taking breath, God is showing up saying, hey, follow me. I see something in you. It's not just T.D. Jakes and Joel Osteen and all the big wigs you see on TV. You, that most of the congregation may not even know your name, and the God of heaven does. And he says, hey, young man, young lady, will y'all follow me? Because I see something in you that I can work with. If nobody else in the room sees it, I see it. Will you follow me? Will you drop what you're doing and follow me? And they do that. Gladly. And Jesus finds a bunch of guys, a bunch of knuckleheads in prison and goes, hey, I can work with that. Murder case, no problem. Sex offender, no problem. Thief, robber, no problem. I can work with that. Y'all follow me? And we dropped what we were doing. <laughs> Not knowing what we were doing, but we dropped it. And we started following, not knowing what we're doing. Because Brother Dan can tell you I was born and raised in church and somehow I missed the point. But I loved church. That's what confused all my friends back then. I was more faithful than anybody. I love youth group. I love church people. I loved all of it. But somehow it never clicked. Probably because I was born and raised in it. So somehow I missed it. <laughs> Until I needed him. And when I needed him, he came running. So I hate what I went to prison for. I hate the circumstance of it. But I wouldn't let you take it away from me for nothing. You can't have that. You take that away, then you take away all the time I've ever had with God. Not where I want to be, but I'm a lot further along than I used to be. Still got a long way to go, a long way to grow, and I'm fine with that. Not perfect. I'm very, very clear of knowing that. But I'm still thankful. I don't care. Even when I screw up now, it's okay. Ain't done with me yet. He ain't done with you yet. He ain't done with us yet. You can't out sin his love. You can't mess up bad enough to mess up his game plan. You just ain't that bad. As much as you think you are, you just ain't that bad to screw up God's plan. See, God's kind of, he's got one up on you. Because the Bible says, y'all know my favorite verse, Psalms 139, 14 through 16. 16 comes along and it says something like this paraphrase. I knew everything you'd ever do, good and bad. If that's not enough, I took the time to record it in my book. Before you lived one day. So Jason, what's your scheme? Disappointment. I hate letting people down. I hate letting friends down. I hate letting family down. I hate letting people down. Because when I do, Satan just comes in and starts digging. Oh, you went to prison for murder. Oh, you came from a good family. You came from good churches. You came from, how did you ever get to a place like that? And then your best friends turn their back on you. And your best friends write you hate mail. You deserve everything that ever happened to you without ever asking what happened. And you're sitting in the cell beating yourself up. Satan's making you feel like a disappointment. Satan's making you feel like a disappointment. And if you're not careful and you don't ever let God deal with that scheme, every time you ever mess up in your life, it all comes flooding back, stacked on top of that. So if your scheme is abandonment, every time you don't get invited to a gig... There's information they don't know. But me and you know what we're talking about right now. Every time you don't get invited to the gig. <laughs> what were you going to do if we invited you to the gig? Since you haven't been operating in your gifts all this time. This, this wasn't an inmate reunion here. This was to show up and let God do his thing deal here. So if you were walking out gifts and talents inside and you come home and you decide to sit on your gifts and talents and not use them, when it comes time for God to call, I'm calling on my brothers that were walking it out inside and they were walking it out out here. Because when it comes time to go to war, I need some men behind me that aren't afraid to go to war. I need some men behind me that aren't afraid to show up to a church and not know if they're going to be a judgmental church or not. We're just going to go because God called. 
we're going to go. We know we're not perfect. We don't care. We know who our God is. So we're going to show up anyway. And if that church receives us, man, awesome. If they don't, awesome. We're still going to do what God's called us to do. Abandonment. Here's the thing. This is crazy because you know what God's telling me right now? Like, my flesh is telling me, don't be saying that because it's going to be on Facebook Live. <laughs> He's on my Facebook. Good. If you just hear it, say the same thing. Because I love this individual and they're going to know who I'm talking about after they watch this on Facebook. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> All that time in prison where God was offending you on purpose. On purpose, God was allowing you to be offended. So when you came home to ministry, you would not waste time in offense, and you could walk out your calling without being hindered. Instead, that, home, that whole time you took on every single offense and didn't learn, and then when you came home, you're still taking on offense. You deal with abandonment, same thing. You've been molested, you've been raped, same thing. You have trust issues, same thing. Mine's disappointment. Every time I let somebody down, may not sound like a big deal to you, but you might as well dumped a load of concrete on top of my shoulders because it takes me all the way back to the first time I ever felt like one and leads me all the way up till today. It ain't that one last disappointment that I did. It's the life of disappointment. And if you don't shake it off real quick, Satan will start breaking you down and break you in half and steal your, uh, uh, your joy is his main thing. Take your joy. Then next thing you know, you're over on the sidelines sitting down thinking, well, I had my chance. I blew it. Well, I got a problem with that because the Bible says that the gifts and the calling of the Lord are irrevocable. So how did I get so far down that I'm sitting here thinking, well, it's over with. I smoked that. I had my shot. Blew it. The Bible says it's irrevocable. I couldn't give it back if I wanted to. If you sit down, you're just going to be miserable until you start doing it again because there's a call, right? You've got to do it. More important than that, my feelings, my emotions, my disappointment, my guilt, my shame... What about that brother right there that needs to get saved? I'm not going to work out my calling because I'm in my feelings and just let him miss the blessing? Hey, life is bigger than you once you sign up for this. Once you sign up for this Jesus stuff, life is not even about you no more. It's about bringing him glory and going out and bringing people to introduce me. And it ain't about numbers. There's some ministries that I cannot be a part of because you can't do that ministry without getting this card and you got to write down all the people you saved that day. You didn't save any. Throw the card away. If you think you have a name to write on that card, you didn't save him. You don't have the power to save. Take your card and put it in your pocket. Throw it away. And just minister to the guy like you're supposed to. Throw the card away. That's what ministry is coming to. You know why one of our visions is coming to churches? Because church is losing its vision for what the church is supposed to do. What is church? I'm going to invite all my lost friends and y'all save them. No. I'm going to invite all my last lost friends and preacher. You save them. No. Church is designed for you to come to church. The preacher gives you the tools for you to go out to the world and save your friends and family. But instead, here's church. It's Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, 1030. If they sing one more song, I'm going to slap everybody in this room. It's 12 o'clock. They know we eat lunch at 12 o'clock. What is wrong with these people? They're going to let one more guy talk? Oh, my God. And there's some people feeling guilty. I didn't say that to make you feel guilty because I was sitting there thinking, man, how long is he going to talk to? <laughs> I'm part of this service. I'm human like you're human. That's why I didn't let Chino have the microphone again. If you give the dude the microphone, you don't never go to lunch. Love you, brother. I love you. you said you're spilled during worship. You're good. Just a, just a perspective, though. We're in church once, maybe twice a week, right? For the most part. There's some churches that have lots and lots of service. For the most part, the average Christian is in church once or twice a week. Once or twice a week for seven days of 24 hours of Satan onslaughting you. Work onslaughting you. Stress onslaughting you. Family problems, friends problems, youth problems, suicide phone calls. Onslaught, onslaught, onslaught. You go to church two times a day, hour and a half to two hours one of those times, and pretty much an hour to an hour and a half the other time. And that's got to get you through seven days of 24-hour periods of Satan just slaughtering you. And in that hour and a half to two hours, it's what time is this going to be over? And the next sentence could be the sentence that's going to change your life or it's going to be the sentence that you need to retain 
so that you can take home or take to work and share with your coworker that's going to change their life. And look how close you are to missing it because, by God, it's rush hour at Denny's. Hey, I get hungry too. I want to go. I've been in some church services. I'm bored to death. I'm hoping this service isn't boring to you guys. It's, it hadn't been to me. It's been a blessing to me. But all I'm saying is we got to change our perspective because the things that we call holy are now becoming not so holy. And church is becoming the routine. It's not even about church anymore. It's not about going and getting tools. It's not about going and saving the world anymore. It's just it's Sunday and if I don't go, I'm going to feel guilty. And brother so-and-so is going to call me and ask me why I wasn't there on church. So I'm going to get up and go so I don't have to face that phone call. Why did you go to church? To miss a phone call from brother so-and-so. But it don't matter that God just wanted to feed you that day. That thing that you've been dealing with all that time, hey, God had allotted that day to dig that root out of you. If you'd go and listen. Not beating you up. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I'm trying to change your perspective. Church has become a thing that you go to. It has, it has lost its value of going to a place to get fed. To take. The Bible says that you are supposed to charge the gates of hell. The Bible does not say that the gates of hell are going to come charging you. Upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What does that mean? The church is supposed to be marching up in the gates of hell, snatching people and pulling them out. And what are we doing? He's got about 10 more minutes before I clock out. If church is nothing else to us that are steadily going to church, and you try to do your due diligence at work and telling the guy where you go to church and how often you go. Trust me, the, the passion that you have in here is the same passion that's on your face in that moment when you're trying to sell him church. I go to a great church. What do y'all talk about? I'm not real sure, but we got free coffee and donuts. You ought to see the size of our nursery. They got the coolest lights up there on that stage. What did he preach about last week? You know, I'm not real sure, but uh, it was good. It was good. Am I saying you got to memorize every service? No, I'm just telling you. We're not invested. We're not invested when we come. We're just not invested. And I'm not saying that to beat you up. I'm saying that to encourage you. Wake up! You got to wake up because you that are faithful and you're coming to church and suffering through it, you got a whole bunch of family and friends that aren't going to come suffer through church and they're going to miss the message if you're not going to speak up on it. You got to find your passion. So let me tell you a couple things and we'll wrap it up and we'll go eat, all right? There's this story in the Bible, Matthew chapter 25, I believe. My scholar brothers can correct me if I'm wrong, because I probably am. Five talents, two talents, one talent. So this Lord comes up and he says, hey, I'm going to go to, I'm paraphrased for time. So I'm going out of town. I'm going to give you five talents is what I'm giving you. And I'm going to give you two talents. And I'm going to give you, you're going to be the bad one, you all right? Kill with that? Okay. You look so mean. All right, I'm going to give you one talent. So somebody gets five, somebody gets two, somebody gets one. I'm going to go away on a trip. When I return, I want to see what you've done with the gifts that I've given you. Okay. Disclaimer. Talents was not money. I didn't just give them money. Okay. It could have been, but it's not the only thing. And the other thing that I didn't just give them was natural gifts and talents. Because the scripture goes on to say that he gave them according to their ability. So he didn't just give them ability, they already had ability. So the thing that he just passed down was not another ability, okay? This was something supernatural we're passing down. It could also be a monetary something. But the real word, you know what it means? Weight. Gave you a certain weight of something. Could be a weight of gold, a weight of silver. But the main word is not just talent, it's really weight. It gave you some weight. What can you do with that weight that I gave you, okay? The guy goes, he comes back, and he finds the guy with five talents. He goes, hey, what did you do with the stewardship? He goes, hey, I took your five, and now I got ten. I hustled. I flipped it. Cool. Enter into the joy of the Lord, good and faithful servant. Hey, you that I gave two, what'd you do with it? I flipped it. I turned it into four. Good and faithful servant. Enter the rest. Enter my joy. You took five and turned it into ten. You took two and turned it into four. Y'all got the same reward. So when it comes to the things of God, is this about competition? 
No. Because if it was about competition, you would have got to enter the rest, and you'd have got to get real close to it. Because you turn yours into ten, you only turn yours into four. So she would get the good gift, you get close to it. We ain't even got to you yet. So when it comes to the things of God, this isn't about a competition. It's just about results. Are you doing anything with what God's given you? Are you doing anything with it? Because I gave you one, what'd you do with it? Well, I heard you were pretty mean. I heard you were pretty cruel. I was just scared of losing it, so I went and buried it. That way, when you show back up, I could at least give you what you gave me. You should be cool with it. You lazy, wicked. That's what he says. Calls him lazy and wicked servant. Pretty much gives him the department from me I never knew you speech. Think about this when we think about talents. Get the money thing out of your head and start thinking about that word weight. Because there was a mentor of mine that told me when I was in prison and I was struggling with the guilt and shame thing. He said, when you get out, Jason, he goes, you operate in your gifts and you don't hold back for nobody under no circumstance. And you make the world feel the weight of who you are in God. So I could show up here knowing that I'm an ex-offender. I could show up here knowing what my crime was. And I could kind of preach and not look anybody in the eye. And This is what God taught me when I was a bad boy. Hope that doesn't offend anybody. You know what I'm saying? Or you can show up and, hey, it's not even me that's talking to you right now anyway. It's the Spirit of God that lives in me. And truth is truth, no matter who it's coming from. Doesn't matter who the messenger is. The message is the whole point. Let the world feel the weight of who you are. Vicki, I give you five talents worth of weight. What are you going to do with that weight? I'm going to make the world feel the weight of who I am. And God, I'm going to flip that and take that five amounts of weight you gave me and turn it into ten. Take five, affect ten. Take two, affect four. Take one, do nothing, and bury it. Let me tell you about that one that took something and buried it. Let's put a monetary value to it now. Let's just say it was... Each talent was $100,000. We'll skip to years. I gave you one that was worth $100,000, and you didn't want to lose any of it. And he said you should at least went and invested in the bank because I could have got that money plus the interest. But you didn't do nothing. You buried it. You know that $100,000 is worth zero because it's not in anybody's hands? That's $100,000 right there. And if I put $100,000 in your hands right now, sister, you could go do something with that, right? But if I go, I know you'll take it. I don't have it. Back up. <laughs> but if I take $100,000 and I bury it, even though it's still $100,000, it's got the value of $100,000, it really has the value of nothing because it's not in anybody's hands. So when I give you a gift, I give you a talent, I give you a calling, I give you whatever, and you're so afraid to walk in it because, man, I can't sing like that dude. And I can't play like this dude. And I can't preach like this dude, and I can't talk like that dude, and I can't praise good sister so and so, and I can't, and you got all your reasons, so you take that gift because it says that God gave everybody something, and you go bury it, its value is zero, even though it came from God. Your gifts, as talented as you are, Fred, I brag on you all the time. Just, you're not there, so it's not to blow your head up, you don't even know about it. But I brag on you all the time because you're very, very talented in a lot of ways. Mo most of my guys, I'm bragging on you all the time. Roger, the way he's, man, just something the dude's got an anointed voice when he sings, I just, ooh, he can get me there. Your gifts are worth nothing if you don't do something with them. I'm trying to imagine the life of the guy I call Fred if he never answered the call. He can play pretty much any instrument that there is. We walked by the generator one day going to the freaking uh, print shop and the thing goes and he goes E flat <laughs> and I said do what? He goes E flat. He goes I hear everything music. I said you got to be kidding me man. No lie. The generator buzzes an E flat if y'all wanted to know. <laughs> Can you imagine the guy that I call Fred never accepting the call? That much gifts, that much talent, and he never played another bass guitar. Never did whatever he's doing to the keyboard. Whatever else he touches just turns to music. What can you do with a toilet? You ever played a toilet before? <laughs> just kidding. The dude can make anything turn to music. My brother Simon, if he never answered the call. Roger, if he never answered the call. 
We sit in the faith-based dorm crying together praying for the wife when there was no wife, when there was no girl even writing. You think we don't have some history? There was no Savannah back then when we're at the table crying, praying. And what was one of your things? What woman's going to take me after what I've done? If you didn't figure it out, that's her. <laughs> but you see the fears that come? So let's wrap it up with this, and I'll let you go. This fear thing. Don't answer my questions if you've never heard me preach. It's always a setup. <laughs> I'm only warning you because I have a lot more friends in here than I normally do. And I don't want you to get on me at work like, dude, you made me feel stupid yesterday. Okay, so no raising your hands. Just listen with me. So, uh, how many of you think, don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand. How many of you think that the spirit of fear is a real spirit? I know they listen, nobody raised their hand. This one you can't answer. You can't answer this one. I won't get on to you too bad. How many have you, let me say it in English. Hold on, let me start over. How many of you, man, tongues is coming out, brother. La, la, la. How many of you have heard people trying to cast out the spirit of fear off you? Now everybody's scared to even move. You all right? Your arms quit working? Okay, Howard, two of us heard it. Okay, well, I've actually done it. I've tried to pray the spirit of fear off people because that's what I believe the Bible was teaching. I believe in spirits. I believe in demons. I believe in all that. Believe in all that. I believe people make money off it and scam it like they do everything else, but I believe in the real deal too. I believe in demons. I've been around them, talked to them, seen them, had them for sellies. That was fun. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so don't, what I'm fixing to tell you or teach you, don't think that I don't believe in the spiritual realm and all that. I do. What I don't believe is, is whenever the Bible talks about God has not given us a spirit of fear, I do not believe that the Bible is talking about a literal spirit of fear that you're going to pray off of me. Let me prove it two ways before you cast your churchy stones. I see some of you cocked back already. Okay, so let's just do grammar, okay? English grammar. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of. Anything, if spirit of fear is a literal spirit, if anything after but of must be spirit too, right? If we're going to believe that the fear is a spirit. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love. Is love a spirit or is it an action? Guess what? <laughs> okay. Love is an action. Okay. There is a spirit of love. I see what you're saying. But I'm talking about you're not going to pray a spirit of love on somebody or pray one off. A spirit, like demon type spirit. Love is not a spirit. Power. Is power a spirit or is power of intangible power? Sound mind, is your sound mind a spirit? No, it's brain matter, thought processes, cognitive, all that good stuff. Okay, so grammar wise, if it was a spirit of fear that we're going to cast off, then also love, power, and sound mind would have to be spirits too. That's not true. But let's just forget all that because most of us hate English. I hated English in school. So let's go to the concordance and look up the Greek word for spirit. And you know what it means? A vital principle. What are vitals? What are vitals? See if you're still alive, right? Something about life. If I'm going to check your vitals, I'm trying to see if you're still breathing. If you're still alive, is the blood pumping? Spirit is a vital principle. It's a vital life principle. It's something that is learned. It's a learned behavior. God has not given you a vital life principle principle of fear he's given you the life principles of love which means you care about others and God more than you do yourself of power supernatural dunamis power that God puts in you to do anything that God wills to do is going to get done by his power and sound mind no more chaos no more craziness peace tranquility a sound logical mind which is the opposite of fear. So somewhere along the way, we have learned to fear things. So as my Christian brother, when I, when I fall into fear, when I'm worried about what people think about me, and I'm worried about because I've fallen into that, I, I'm one of those guys that has always said, I don't care what people think about me. 
And I was obviously put in this situation a month ago to where I found out I care about what people think about me. All the way to the point to where it started consuming me and shutting me down. And then here comes the scheme of disappointment. What are you going to do? And God is so cool. He takes some chump that I met in prison named Chino. <clears throat> If you have friends that listen to God, you ought to thank God for them. Because when you find yourself in a place that you thought you'd never be again, having thoughts you never thought you'd have again, and it wouldn't get that dark again, And a Christian brother sends you this text in that moment. In that moment. Hey, I pray for you. Just felt like God told me to send you this real quick. If you're going to live by the praises of men, then you better be prepared to die by their critiques, by their criticisms, right? If you're going to live by the praises of men, then you better be prepared to die from their criticisms. If you're a guy that your scheme is disappointment, it doesn't take much disappointment to become a freaking boulder because that's your scheme. That's the one that Satan plays with you with, right? So that may make you laugh because that's not your deal. But if I could find out what your deal is, it would be the same thing for you. You understand what I'm saying? Where does that fear come from? Because it's not even real. And the only way to ever escape fear is you start replacing fear, which are also lies. Worry is lies. You start replacing fear and lies with truth. What does God say? God says, I knew everything that you would ever do before you lived one day. And by the way, I took time to write it in my book. You know what? I knew about the murder case. I knew about all that. I knew where you're at today. By the way, I thought you were worth it, so I went ahead and made you anyway. Because when your scheme is disappointment, you need to find out that the Word of God says, how can you disappoint somebody that knows, somebody, that, that knows everything you're ever going to do and chooses to make you anyway? How can you logically be a disappointment to somebody if they know everything you're ever going to do and they make you anyway? Well, let's scrap that so next time Satan comes with it, uh, 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 guess what, I got my life verse. Now, when God says you're a king or you're a queen, where you're part of the royal priesthood, and Satan comes along trying to make you feel like scum, you better know some scripture. You better know some verses. When the scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your... Why does it tell you to even do that? Because you're going to come to a day where you're at war. And all you have is the tools that you spent gathering all this time. And if you have no tools to combat those lies, then you have nothing to fight with. And all you can do is accept defeat. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Church. There's people here from all kinds of churches. So the churches that you go to, if you're not already, get invested. When I say invested, I mean involved. We are killing our pastors. Meet one. Ask him about his phone calls 2 o'clock in the morning, what they're like. It ain't always pray for Sister Susie, she's got cancer. Sometimes it's come pray for my dog. And I'm not even playing. That's the phone calls they get at 2 in the morning while they're trying to sleep, while they're spending time with their family. Could you pray for my dog? He's acting a little funny. Yes, I'll bring my gun. 
I'm sorry, my bad. No, but hey, I'm flesh too sometimes. It comes out. That was not from the Spirit of God, my bad. I'll quit listening for a second. You need to get invested. One of the things they tell us in prison, when you get out and you get up underneath the pasture, go ask him, how can I work for you? And if he says picking up the trash, you show up every week and you pick up the trash after church. That's how you start serving. Because we were all in ministry. We spoke several nights a week, played several nights a week. When you get out, guess what your brain thinks you're going to do? Who are you? You don't know who I am? I've been preaching the last 10 years. You don't know who I am? Everybody in there thought I was something. Yeah, pick up the trash. Trash. But they trained us for that before we ever came home. So guess what? We came home willing to pick up trash. Even though we ran ministries. Even though we started projects. We started programs. We were responsible for those programs. We came home willing to pick up trash. Because they trained us to be that way when we came home. When it's time for God to exalt you out here, he'll do it. But you go home and pick up some trash for your preacher. Go sweep and mop the bathrooms. Ask him if you can mow. Whatever. I don't want to get off track. Y'all get the point. Go back to your churches and ask your pastor, what can I do for you? How can I get invested? Meaning, how can I get involved? Take a load off of your pastor wherever you go, wherever you're going. Take a load off of him. Get involved. Because there's no greater investment that you're ever going to make than investing in people. It's going to grow you and it's going to grow them. And God just happens to call that discipleship. Y'all stand with me. I would actually like, is Cassidy in here? Cass, will you come play that song? I'm going to kick these guys off the stage for a second. I know it's late time to go, so let's wrap this thing up in five or ten minutes. But I want my guys to stand up here. And I want Cass to come play this song that I love. And I'm not going to give a whole long altar call. I'm just going to make it simple like this. Would you give us the honor of praying with you before you leave? If there's anything you're going through, anything on your mind, you never received Christ, we know how to do all that. If you just want prayer for something, just want a word of encouragement, want a blessing, would you let these guys that have been praying for this for 10 years bless you with some kind of prayer? Bow your heads and I'll say a prayer because I know some people... We're going to have to go anyway. But if you'd like to receive prayer, please come up let us pray for you. Lord God, we just thank you for this amazing day, this amazing opportunity, uh, the vision that you gave us 10 years ago to come to pass. We thank you, God, that you brought us to this place, that you chose Driven Life Church to do it at for the first time, and we thank you for wherever you see us. Yeah. That's that dunamis power right there up to anybody. <laughs> Woo. Man, I thought he was, thought I said something wrong. He was killing me for a second there. Like, Good. <laughs> My bad. I take it back. Lord God, we just thank you for this church, wherever you want to send us to next time. Lord God, we just want to be uh, faithful to you, Lord. We want, want you to continue to grow in us, continue using us. Uh, just put us to work, God. We'll keep picking up trash as we sing and as we preach. We don't care. But Lord, the, the big thing in my heart, when we go to these churches, we just want to get in, in my heart, my heart, the thing you've given me, I want to encourage the congregation, man, to get involved. Don't just be another person taking up a chair. Get involved. Get invested before you miss the boat before you miss the people that God has entrusted into your life. For you, you personally, God, the Holy Spirit in you personally, ordained to change certain people in your circle. Don't miss that. And you're going to if you don't get involved, if you don't get invested. Lord, we always pray for the youth, Lord God. We don't want the youth to have to go through what we went through. We want them to bypass that. Hey, take the shortcut. Skip the prison thing. Just stay in church. Get involved in church. Get a job. And go to work. Skip the prison thing. We pray for the parents. We pray for the wives that have husbands that are locked up. The husbands that have wives that are locked up. We want to encourage them. Hey, if they're following Jesus in there, it'll be worth it. Just keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. Don't give up on them. When they come home, talk to these churches. Hey, when these inmates come home, hey, give them a place. Give them a place in your sanctuary where they can sit and feel welcome. Shake their hand just like you shake everybody else's hand. Because like one of our brothers stood up here and said, you don't know what it meant to us to come out of that place and somebody come wrap their arms around our neck knowing where we came from and they didn't care. I thank you for everyone in this congregation that you would bless them. One, for just sitting through a, a longer service than normal. Bless them for that. But I pray that they leave here so filled up. I pray that they, they enjoyed the worship, that they loved it, that they pressed into your presence. 
the, the different words that were spoken, I pray that they leave with at least a nugget from one of us that said something, a nugget from your word, a nugget from their story that they'd get to go home and share with somebody. Lord, don't let this be a waste. But God, you waste nothing. And we thank you that you waste nothing. So the next few minutes, Lord God, we just want to pray over your people and say thank you for this service. Thank you for everyone that was involved in being here today. Just, just an amazing day. We thank you for it, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen.